all that sort of good stuff. So tomorrow I'm going to focus on post-processing. Today I want to focus on engineering. Ready? Are we ready? Yes. <laughs> I want to start with the history of the color blue. Because we're going to be talking about other colors here, but blue is very predominant in our next images. And I find the history of the color blue extremely fascinating. The color blue is ever present in our skies and our oceans, and we're called the planet. But it is very rare in earth-bound plants and animals. We don't find a lot of naturally occurring things that are tangible. What I mean by this is if you go out and I say, go collect me a bucket of blue water. You can't do that. Even if the ocean looks blue, rivers look blue, you can't go get me a bucket of blue water. You can't go get me a jar of blue sky. It just doesn't happen. So we don't find this in a tangible form very often. Early humans had no word for the color blue, and in fact, in Homer's The Odyssey, it was actually the ocean was described as a wine red sea. When we describe the ocean today as a wine red sea, we would think of a very, very different color than what we actually perceive it as. In fact, in modern language, the word blue is derived from words for black, or it was sometimes green. The first tangible blue actually came from ancient Egypt, where they took azurite or malachite, that's that um, stone in the bottom corner right there, and they treated this to make a blue pigment for dyes and paints and all sorts of things like that. And then later they imported lapis lazuli, which is the top stone there, and they dubbed this true blue. The color of paint that came from this was called ultramarine back in the day, way back in the day. And it was really, really expensive because, again, we don't have a lot of tangible blue on the planet. So it was really only for the wealthy and thus deemed royal blue. That's where we get that term. And that's often the color that we're searching for when we're using blue in our images. Uh, blue is actually a very calming and a tranquil color, and it can actually create space visually. And what I mean by this is that if you have an ocean in your image, it gives a place for the viewer's eye to rest. So we can use this color to really create space, and that's a really fun thing to do with the color blue. Before we dive into technical and applications on all that, I want to have you guys train your brain for at least the next hour to think of your images as works of art. Just like a painter wields a painter on the artwork, you guys wield a camera to create masterpieces. And once we start thinking in terms like this, we can relate our images to paintings and other artwork like that. We can use color in a couple different ways, and I'm going to talk about specifically three different ways here. The first is to set a mood. Color can evoke many emotions, and we can use this to our advantage when we're photographing, when we're editing. Color can also guide the viewer through your image in a very, very meaningful way. And finally, you can tell a story with color. Crafting a pow powerful story is very huge when you're composing, when you're shooting, all that sort of thing. So color can be used to aid in this process and help tell your stories. I'm gonna talk first about color harmonies. If you've ever taken an art class, elementary school, high school, college, or just as an adult, you probably have heard about color harmonies at one point or another. It's the most prominent thing, the first thing you learn in a color theory class. In color theory, a color harmony refers to aesthetically pleasing and harmonious color combinations based on geometric relationships on the color wheel. So what this means is you can make a square or a triangle, and we'll kind of talk about the most prominent color harmonies that we find in our night images and how we can find those in nature. Because again, we want to focus on finding these in the field and then enhancing them in post-processing. Starting with an analogous color scheme, this is probably the easiest to find at night. This is when a group of colors lie directly adjacent to each other on the color wheel. You can see at the top here with the color wheel and how this image, those are colors pulled from this image. So we have pinks and purples and blues, but they're all right next to each other on the color wheel. So in nature, where can we actually find these? We can find these in Areas that are predominantly one color family, for example, a green forest with a lot of green trees. And then we have a blue sky from the Milky Way 
that's going to do greens and blues and create your analogous color harmony. We can also find these in areas that are reflective of light. So that's what I pictured here in this image. This is a famous Wanaka tree. You're probably butchering that pronunciation in New Zealand. And I shot, I do a lot of blue hour blending or compositing. I most always shoot my foregrounds at blue hours. So I'm going to talk a lot about that throughout this presentation. But because this area is reflective of light, anything in the sky is going to reflect in the foreground. This not only connects the sky in the foreground, but it brings harmonious color through your own your whole image from front to back. So this Milky Way was taken just after sunset, and it was a gorgeous sunset. There was lots of color in the sky, and you can see what remains of the sunset in the sky here. I have these nice wispy clouds that are still taking up the pink light from the sun, even though it's long gone down. And because that foreground is reflective of that light, now my foreground is also picking up those tones. I also shot the, blue, the foreground during blue hour, and it's very important to note, and we'll touch on this a little bit more later, but I shot this just as the sun went below the horizon. And the reason I did that is because I wanted that alpha glow on the mountains in the back there. So you see that nice pink color. So again, I'm bringing that pink down into the foreground. Here's two other examples of an analogous, analogous color harmony. We're gonna start with the one on the right. This was taken out in the Badlands of New Mexico. This is also an area that's reflective of light. So we don't have to have water or ice all the time. We can actually use places like this. The geography is made up of this kind of shale material. And if I had shot this foreground in golden hour, this whole foreground would appear much more yellow in color. And therefore, because I shot it at blue hour, those blue hour tones are reflecting in the foreground, giving me that color harmony. <clears throat> On the left here, I have an image from Sedona. And as you can see, the most prominent color in this image is the owl's clover in the field. But Sedona is also very famous for its red rocks. And this, again, is where timing comes in key because I shot this either right after the sun went down. Yes, it had to be right after the sun went down, but the sun had just gone below the horizon because I needed that light to reflect on those rocks in the background to give me that reddish tone. If I had waited till later in blue hour, it would be much more blue in tone. And what does red plus blue equal? Purple, right? I kind of, yes, I want a little bit of purple in here, but I don't want it to compete with the foreground. So I'm waiting for the right exact time to shoot this image. And then in the sky, I leaned a little bit into the purples in post-processing and put it a little bit more magenta and tint to bring that color harmony together, as opposed to having more of a cyan of blue green sky. Complementary is another one we can find easily in nature or we can create in nature. This is when two or more colors glide directly across from each other on the color wheel. You can see I've shown the color wheel for this image here. And in nature, specifically with night photography, and this is the beauty of it, is we can kind of create this when we're out in the field using light paint. And if we have a lighting tool or a light painting tool that can change the temperature, you can go warmer in the color and have a blue sky, and now you have a warm versus cool color harmony, complementary. See, they lie directly across from each other on the color wheel. So in this image, I have those kind of grasses, and then I have the warm light from the lantern and the warm color from the wood of the house and then the blue sky. But I'm still bringing the color from the foreground up into the sky a little bit because we have some light pollution. And again, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but I brought that orange color up into the sky using that light pollution. We can also find this in flora or in water with a colorful sky. So if you have remnants of a sunset and say there's pink in the clouds still and you have a predominantly green foreground, that's going to create a complementary color harmony. And then probably the most classic is warm foreground in the desert versus a cool sky. And you'll see this a lot in teal-orange combinations, but I have this in the image on the right. So again, in the field, 
I shot this just as the sun went below the horizon, so I could pick up on those warm tones left over on, in the sun. If you've ever been to Gotham Valley, which is where this is taken, those rocks are really red. They rival Sedona red rocks. They're very, very red. And I wanted to play off that. Instead of shooting in that later blue hour where I would get more purple tones or more blue tones, I really wanted to go for that complementary color harmony. And then on the left here, we have an image out in Colorado with the wildflowers. And this is actually a split complementary color harmony. I didn't want to do a full si slide on this, but you can see that there's one color, the blue purples, and then directly across, almost, we have the greens and the yellows. So consider the most prominent colors in your image and maximize them compositionally. So you have the center of this column line that's really yellow, and yellow, at night really draws your eye. So instead of standing back and making those flowers small where the yellow wouldn't be a predominant part of my composition, I got really, really up close with a wide angle lens and I kind of tilted down to really exaggerate that. So the yellow now becomes a main focal point for the image. And then of course I have the green lichen on the rocks and the green of the hills and then the blue of the sky. So we have green, yellow, and this blue purple because the column lines also have purple. So we're creating a split complementary color harmony here by using compositional techniques. Monochromatic. So this is one that's a little bit trickier. It's a single hue on the color wheel, and it includes various tonal values of that color from light to dark. Now in nature, we don't usually find these true to form because there's all sorts of little different intricate colors in a scene. So we can, we can do this color harmony, but we have to isolate colors and isolate our subject. So you usually find this more in intimate scenes or can create this more in intimate scenes. So this image on the right, I created out in the Utah Badlands, and I used a focal length of 70 millimeters for my foreground. So I could really hone in on the subject and clear everything else out and focus on that and the colors there. Now in this area, there's not a lot of other colors around, but say I had orange sun on the left-hand side that was bouncing off the cliff walls. I can isolate that in here. You can also do think of sand dunes. Sand dunes is a really great way to do this. Um, the hills of Tuscany I've included here, something that's predominantly one color, so you're taking an analogous color harmony and then you're using your focal length to simplify it so that it becomes more monochromatic. It's also really important to note here that the Milky Way in here, you can't see very many other colors besides blue. I specifically did that to create this color harmony and you'll notice it's kind of a, a reoccurring theme throughout my work as of late. I've become really fascinated with blue and I used to have a lot of pink and purple tones and I kind of simplified it down to more blue now. Either way is really great, but I've just become obsessed, so. <laughs> and then you might not be as familiar with the dyad color harmony. This is a group of two colors that are separated by two hues on the color wheel. So this, of course, is not a true dyad because you can see more separation there on the color wheel, but this is pretty close to illustrate this point. At first glance, you might think it's an analogous color harmony because we have blues and greens, but I shifted the tint of the overall photo towards magenta, or you can do it in your HSL sliders with like blue shifting it a little more towards the purple, and the point of doing this is to give separation between the blue and the green here, or blue and red, or yellow and blue, whatever kind of combination you want to use. But this requires thinking through to the edit. When you're out in the field, you want to think, how am I going to edit this so you can capture it accordingly? In the field, you want to pay close attention to yellows and blues because these are the easiest to shift to create that separation in post-processing. So I'm going to do a pop quiz with you. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have two images here, and the one on the left is one we're going to start with. This is out in the New Mexico Badlands also. And I've included a little strip of the colors that are predominantly blue there. And I'm going to give you a little hint with the color wheel. 
Can anyone tell me what color I mean this is? Monochromatic. You guys are good. You pay attention. <laughs> so in this image, I kept the tones of the Milky Way. I'm reiterating this. I kept the tones of the Milky Way mostly blue tones. So I cut out the pinks, the magentas, everything else that we see there to create this color scheme. Okay, I give you a hint on the right with the color wheel. Split complementary. So we have blue, we have magenta, and we have green here. Because red rocks at blue hour, red plus blue equals what? Purple. So in this case, it's more magenta because those rocks are so orange. And then we have blue skies. And I kept that more towards the blue side and away from the purple side. And then we have a pop of green from the cacti. And this is really important here because I included it in a predominant role in my composition. It's very important in my composition to lead you from the front to the back, and it's kind of like having a conversation with the, the rocks in the background here. So, yeah, yeah, it's the, So this is a composite, in case you can tell. The Milky Way is not there when there's snow there. Um, but I did a lot of those. <laughs> but basically, because I have this cactus in here, it turns it into a split complementary. If I didn't have this cactus here, it would be more along the terms of a dyad. So because I prioritize that cactus in my composition, I'm now changing the color harmony throughout the image in the field. So let's talk about why color theory and how we can compose with color. How we can use it to tell images or tell stories in our images, how we can create a mood and visually lead the viewer through our work of art. Set the mood. <laughs> color psychology is actually the study of colors and how it affects human behavior. Warmer colors like red have associations with emotion like love and anger. And these are more visually stimulating colors, so they have elicit stronger emotional reactions. Whereas cooler colors like blue can elicit feelings of tranquility and calm. And this image on the bottom right, I took this out in Death Valley and there was a bunch of clouds throughout the night and right during astronomical twilight, so it's still not even nighttime yet, I captured the sky and there was one single star that was piercing through. You can't see it because I kind of made it small, but I used muted blue tones throughout this image because I really wanted to create that peaceful, calm, stargazing feeling. You can use this knowledge to adjust colors in the field or in post-processing or compositionally to evoke emotions from your viewers in the scene and really set the mood. I've included three other pictures here for works of art, and they're from famous painter Mark Rothko, and he consistently painted rectangular regions of color, and these were sometimes really big, so that when you would go and you would view his work and you would stand there, they would kind of take up your whole vision. And he did this to elicit emotional response from his viewer. And he entitled them dramas, or he intended them as little dramas. Just find that really fascinating. We can also use color to direct the viewer's eye throughout our image. Our eyes are drawn to warm, bright things and drawn away from cool, dark things. So warmer colors like red, orange, yellow, pink and will bring objects in your image to the foreground or to the front of the image. And cooler tones like blue, purple, and green will push objects backwards. So we can use this knowledge in conjunction with the knowledge of light and composition to direct the viewer's eye through an image. So as I was taught in art school, I have a graphic design background. And as I was taught there, we need to learn the rules so we can break the rules. So in this image on the right, I'm kind of doing the opposite of what I just told you. I'm using the green to draw your eye through the image. So I'm gonna tell you a little story about this image. Um, this is out in Grand Staircase Escalante and there's like these big black rocks right in front of this arch. And there's not these rocks anywhere else. And on these rocks, as you can see, there's this beautiful seafoam green lichen or lime green lichen and it's just kind of otherworldly. And even though you see lichen a lot in the desert, 
I don't often associate it with the desert, so I made up a story about this image, and I thought, hey, this meteor fell from the sky and blasted a hole through this rock, and that's what created this arch, and these are the leftover fragments. Of course, that's not how this arch was really created. That was just a story I came up with in my head. So how can I use color and composition to tell that story? Whether you get that or not doesn't matter, but because there's something there, it's always already a more compelling image. So instead of using warmer, bright colors to draw the eye, I used the green and seafoam green of the lichen to draw the eye by placing it on anchor points in the left and right hand corners and making an arrow directly to the arch. I also toned down in post-processing. I know we're not talking about that so much here, but I toned down in post-processing the reds and the blues, desaturated them so that the green was the most vibrant part of this image. So even though it's technically a cooler color, it's still leading your eye through it. So let's talk about how to combine color and light, because light is very important um, in terms of color as well. A well-crafted composition is formed by combining unrelated elements into an aesthetically pleasing whole. And light and color are the glue that hold those elements together in photography. They create open communication between the main subject and its environment. So in this case, the main subject is the cholla. Now again, I shoot at blue hour, so light is really important here, but you can do this with moonlight, you can do this with long exposures. You can even do it with light painting. It just becomes a little bit different in how you approach the scene. But because I shot this foreground in blue hour out in Joshua Tree, there's one thing specifically that I need to know. Actually two, we'll say two. I need to know where the direction of light is coming from. Because Choya, as you can see here, glow if they're backlit. So I shot this just before sunrise, and the sun is probably literally minutes from coming above the horizon, and I did that so I could get those nice warm tones from the sun versus the cool tones. Even at blue hour, when the sun is lower, you still get a glow off Choya. If I had shot it at blue hour sunset, the sun would have been directly behind me, and therefore it would have front lit the Choya, and it wouldn't have had the same effect. I wouldn't have been able to lead you in the same way through the image. So timing. Very, very important, if you couldn't already tell. And then the color, I again brought the color from the foreground into the sky. So if you've ever shot in Joshua Tree, specifically in the last few years, the light pollution, even though Joshua Tree itself is a dark sky park, the light pollution around Joshua Tree is getting worse and worse and worse. But I used that to my advantage in this way, so I warmed it up and brought your eye from the main subject to the environment. I also use cool dark tones to divert the viewer's eye from unimportant elements. So like you don't need to know the dirt that the cactus is sitting in. That mountain on the right is not important. What's important is the choya and how it relates to the stars because of the Haiti Milky Way here. So I cooled down and darkened the dirt area and that mountain on the right to really direct your eye where I wanted it to go. So now that we've learned how color and light affect mood and can direct our viewer's eye through our photo, we can use these two elements in com com combination together and really tell a story. So we can create a story with light and color. I use warm tones specifically in here to draw the eye because the eye is generally drawn towards bright warm tones. And then I left the rest of it in cool tones to create a sense of mystery because they're dark and they're cool. So this again is in Goblin Valley, but it looks much different than the other Goblin Valley shot I showed you, right? The rocks here are still very red. But what I did to capture this image in field to create this story is I shot the whole foreground during blue hour. And this was kind of late blue hour, about 40 minutes after sunset so that I could really get those blue tones. I used a pretty cool white balance when I was out in the field. And once I was finished doing that, I had the model go and sit in the cave and hold the lantern, which is actually a makeshift water bottle with a lube and a gel, <laughs> and hold it up so that I could 
isolate those warm tones to the cave, and they're spilling out a little bit, again, to read your eye there, but they're mostly isolated to the cave. And the sense that I was trying to create is that she's warm and safe in this cave. She's wandering the desert, and now she's found shelter and she's safe. And then outside is kind of this air of mystery. We don't know what's out there. Who's hiding among those goblin rocks, right? But this can be done with any hero element in your shot. It doesn't have to be the human element. Even though we have a human in a, in a photo, we're automatically drawn to that. But you can do it with any hero element, any main subject. And you can use light painting in a creative way to tell the viewer what the story is about and set the mood. So let's talk about light painting just for a moment and how we can use it to introduce colors or direct the eye and all that good stuff. So first off, what we need is a water bottle and a loom cube and a gel. Just kidding. <laughs> you want a light painting tool that you can adjust the temperature of. This is really important when you're talking about terms of in terms of color, because you want to be able to adjust the light either cooler or warmer, and it's a bonus if you can change the light painting tool to any color you want, because then you can really do some neat stuff with storytelling. You also want to be able to change the brightness. So if you're shooting at night, the brightness is going to really play an important key, because if it's too bright, it's just going to wash out all the color. You're not going to have a lot of saturation there, so you're going to want to be able to turn it to very low, like 1% or something like that. So if you use a warmer temperature during blue hour or even in moonlight, it will contrast with the other blue tones happening in the image, and this will draw the viewer's eye there because it is a warmer town. Because this light is orange, not only is it the brightest thing in there, but it's also very orange, so it's drawing your eye there. So this is another one of my stories. <laughs> This is Cyclops Arch out in Alabama Hills, and it's aptly named that because it looks like a Cyclops skull. It looks like a skull ahead of a person or whatever. And so I found this ridge right here that looks kind of like fingers or a hand. So I imagine the Cyclops is just sitting there gazing up at the stars, right? And I specifically shot this during Blue Hour because I love it, <laughs> but also because I want you to look at his eyeballs or where his eyeballs should be. Right? I want you to focus there. Yes, the hand is important. Yes, the Milky Way is important, but that's not where I want your eye to go to first. So bonus tip, try paint light painting at blue hour. It's really, really fun. You'll need to turn your light a lot brighter than you think it should be. But it's really fun, can, or even moonlight, because you can use the light of the sun or the moon to actually light the rest of your foreground, and then just place light where you want it to be, and it can be really fun to play with stories that way. So, we're gonna talk about white balance now, and getting it right in the field, and this is probably the most controversial topic <laughs> that happens in color theory. But white balance is used to shift a mood of an image on the warm, cool axis. So this is from blue to yellow. So think of it as in your temperature slide, but we're talking about in camera. So blue to yellow. And we need to understand what we, it is and how we can use it both correctively and aesthetically. And before we can do that, we need to talk about color separation. So usually colors, if you take um, a photo in your camera in auto white balance, it does a pretty good job of determining the colors of the scene and it looks pretty close to what it actually looked like when you're standing there. But our cameras are machines, they're not human people, and it can get confused sometimes. It can make it too warm or too cool. So by setting your white balance in the field, you have more control over that. And it also makes your job easier during your post-processing. So many people say white balance doesn't matter as long as you shoot in raw, and this is mostly true. There are some instances where it definitely does matter, but for the most part, it's true. But you have to do extra steps to get to the place you want to be when you can just get it right in camera first, and then you have less post-processing time, and most of us would probably enjoy that. So because I, again, shoot blue hour lens, I want to talk about the foreground and the sky kind of separately, and this will apply to whether you shoot long exposures 
bring the foreground away, you shoot moonlight or light paint, anything where you're shooting the foreground and sky separately. So because I shoot at blue hour, there's really cool tones that are happening during this time. So to achieve those blue hours that I'm there are blue tones that I'm perceiving, I want to be at a cooler white balance, which is a lower Kelvin, and I'll get to that next. But I don't want to be so cool that I lose all the other colors in the image. And for lack of a better term, I always say you don't want it to look like you threw up blue all over your back of your camera. So in this image on the right, this is Escalante, and these rocks are kind of white or tan in color, and they have kind of red stripes going through them, and then I have a tree which is green. So I shot this again in a cooler tone, but it's not so cool that you can't tell there's, red, there's other colors there. It's not just all blue. And then the Milky Way. If you're shooting it separately, scientifically speaking, the accurate color of the Milky Way or a star or sky in a moonless night is really warm in tone. You would be surprised what it actually looks like. But we perceive it when we're standing there observing the cosmos as more cool in tones. And so aesthetically speaking, we usually use a cooler white balance. And because we don't have all the blue tones from blue hour, we can go cooler than we would at blue hour. Again, a lower Kelvin. But when you photograph the Milky Way, unless you're going for a monochromatic color harmony, you generally want those pinks and those yellows and those oranges, all the other colors that are there present in the night sky, maybe even some green if you get some air glow. So you're gonna wanna go blue, but not too blue that you can't see that. So when you're standing there taking a picture on the back of your camera and you're trying out these white balances and you're taking a test shot, remember to review that test shot for color and make sure you can see different colors in the Milky Way. As subtle as they may be, you can enhance them in post. So Kelvin is how we manually adjust our white balance. And it's meant, white balance is meant to neutralize white, but then we want to enhance it aesthetically if we're changing it in the field to get closer to what we have a vision of our artwork would look like in post-processing. So on the, the left here, I have a chart, and this chart is not the Kelvin of that temperature at that time, but it's actually the number that you would neutralize the whites or balance the whites, make them more pure white in the image. So we're going to talk about just sunrise or sunset because I feel like this is the easiest example of this. Over here we know that sunrise or sunset is very, very yellow and warm in color. So to get that balanced white, we actually need to go much cooler in our white balance and here is listed as 2500. But if we did that in camera, it would be kind of blah. It wouldn't really pop, it's just neutral, it's neutral in tone. So because we know we have to go neutral in tone to neutralize it, and then aesthetically speaking, we're capturing a sunset for all those pinks and those oranges and those golden colors, so we're gonna up our white balance a little bit, probably around 6,000 Kelvin or somewhere thereabout. So that's aesthetically speaking. So we're not technically balancing the whites at that point, we're using it to our advantage and how we want it to see, how we want it to look like. So a higher number equals more yellow. So remember we're using, moving on the yellow-blue temperature scale. So a higher number is gonna equal more yellow, i.e. a warmer image, whereas a lower number is going to equal more blue or a cooler image. So specifically speaking, again, about shooting the foreground separate from the sky, twilight, blue hour, or moonlight, we want to both neutralize the whites and aesthetically make them look good. So we were using a Kelvin around 3,700 to 4,700, 4, and this will balance the white in an overall cool appearance, but it will still leave room for the other colors. And then the Milky Way, because we just learned, or we already knew, that a moonless night sky is scientifically warm, we're gonna again use a cooler color, but we can go cooler than we would at blue hour, so like 3,200 to 4,000. You also wanna keep in mind that different cameras capture colors in a different way. I always shoot Sony, and my images are often blue to begin with. If you shoot Nikon, you'll probably notice they're a little blue-green. If you shoot Canon, it handles warmer tones much better. So that's why I gave kind of a range there. 
that you should play with. Play with it, see what you like, see what looks good, see where you're, you're falling off on that color separation. Your camera also has presets built in, and I've listed the most common here, and I wanna talk about one in specific, um, but we have tungsten on the left, that's probably the coolest, and it's about 3200 Kelvin, and it's usually used to offset artificial light, indoor light, and then on the right we have shade, which is gonna be the most warm, and it's about 7,000 Kelvin, and it's used to offset the strong blue tones found in outdoor shade. So we kind of, we can use these presets if you don't wanna change the Kelvin manually, and this is actually what I use. Um, I use fluorescent preset, but in my Sony it has a couple different options. But what's good about the fluorescent preset that I find that I really like, it's about 4,000 Kelvin, give or take, and it has those blue tones, but it also has a little bit of red or magenta tones in it because it's usually used to offset the greenish tones found in fluorescent lighting. So it comes out to this really pretty color blue. You would have to try it on your own camera. I can tell you for Sony's it's amazing, um, but give it a try, see what it looks like. And then for all my Sony people, you too? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so for all my Sony people, I'm gonna give you the secret if you ever do blue hour blending. My foregrounds, I always shoot in fluorescent daylight plus two. So this will give you about 4,700 Kelvin, and then it adds those magenta tones in. And for my night skies, for just the sky, I shoot at fluorescent cool white, and it has little zero in parentheses. So this is a little bit cooler than the daylight plus two, but still has a little bit of those magenta tones in it. Okay. For those of you who don't shoot Sony, you can achieve the same look by either trying out your fluorescent, because I'm not sure exactly how they look on different cameras, but you can also set, say for blue hours, set your white balance to 4,700 Kelvin, and then go into your white balance adjustment. I've included a little screenshot here on the bottom right of what it looks like on a Sony, but it probably looks very similar on all the other cameras. And you can adjust and add those red tones in. So if I'm adjusting this white balance preset, I'm usually only adjusting it on the green magenta tint axis, axis, <laughs> not the yellow blue, because the yellow blue I can just adjust my Kelvin. Like, I, I can choose a different preset if I want to adjust yellow to blue. So I'm usually only using this for magenta or green, but keep in mind, make a note somewhere mentally that you changed it so you can change it back because you don't want to leave it that way <laughs> because you'll be like, why is my picture looking so pink? So I want to show you three different images. Um, same image, shot at different white balances. And again, I can go into Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw and go to the temperature slider and type in these numbers and get something relatively similar to as I shot in the field. You can definitely change that, even if you use white, auto white balance. But the point I wanna make here is that if I shot my image at 3,700 Kelvin, you can see that it's mostly, or sorry, 3,500 Kelvin, you can see that it's mostly blue and you don't see those yellow tones in the clouds. That's because I neutralized the white here. So this is a neutral kind of thing. The white is kind of pure white. And then for aesthetic purposes, I would want to change it to 4700 and then actually adjust the tones with the HSL sliders or something so I can bring out those yellows and oranges that I found in the scene. But I'm doing that extra step. Whereas if I just shot it like I shot it in the field at 4700, or this is actually fluorescent cool white zero on my Sony, if I shot it like that in the field, I don't have to do extra work. So we want to work smart, not hard. And then you can see on the right, we have 6500 Kelvin, and that's very warm. We have a lot of yellows and green, but we're missing that color separation again. So if we shoot it right in the field, we spend less time post-processing. And sometimes, Auto white balance can get it really difficult to where you have to involve masking out certain areas so you can add color or decrease color in certain areas versus just using HSL sliders or selective color or something like that. So that's my spiel. Just hold on. <laughs>
I want to touch on the light at night because as we learned before, light affects color in very specific <coughs> ways, and especially at night. Light is just as important in night photography as it is in, as it is in sunset or sunrise photography. Maybe even more important because it takes a lot less light to affect your night photo than it does to affect your day photo. So you need a lot more light to change anything during the day. So natural light at night. Let's go over how some these three, specifically blue hour, astro twilight, and moonlight, affect the color of our images depending on when we shoot. Because we use a cooler white balance at night, we need to understand how blue relates to the colors produced at different times during the night. So let's start with blue hour. Blue hour is when the sun sets. It's just below the horizon, not sunset, it's after sunset. When it's just below the horizon or before sunrise, when it, before the sun has come up. Generally speaking, in the field, this is about 40 minutes before sunrise or 40 minutes after sunset. And the color during this time of night is just as it sounds. Can anyone guess? Blue. Blue. <laughs> so we need to adjust accordingly for this. So that's why we're using a warmer white balance when we're shooting blue hour than when we're shooting Milky Way. So again, that 4700 is kind of the sweet spot for blue hour, generally speaking. So because we know that it's more blue in tone, we're trying to warm it up. Still keep those blue tones because that's the whole point of shooting at blue hour. Well, one of the points. But we want to kind of warm it up a little bit. Then we have astro twilight or astronomical twilight. And this specifically, in my opinion, relates to the sky in the Milky Way. So during astronomical twilight, the stars are just starting to appear. So this is kind of like the bookends of night, if you look in photo pills. It's before nighttime begins and after nighttime ends. And during this time, we often see more pink tones in the Milky Way when we're capturing it. So this image above, this little section, that Milky Way was shot literally just before sunrise. So you can see that the stars are kind of faded. They're not, you're not gonna get as much contrast and depth during this time, but the colors are really beautiful. So more pink tones, pink plus blue equals magenta, purple. So you're, it can go purple really fast. So you really want to pay close attention to that, especially in post-processing, but also in setting your white balance in the field. And as the sun sets, light gets shot out from the sun. And it, that light has to travel through a thicker atmosphere. It has to travel much farther. So the blue light, which are shorter white waves, wavelengths, they are scattered, and the longer red wavelengths are what comes through. So that's why we get these pink tones here. So try shooting the Milky Way right as the sun, right as, right before it gets night, or right after nighttime has ended. And you might find some cool colors there. And then we have moonlight, and shooting with moonlight has very, very many factors. You have phases, you have position. It, it's very, very plan oriented. Light, the light from the moon itself is just reflected light from the sun, so it's very yellow in color. What is yellow plus blue equal? Green. So oftentimes when we're shooting in moonlight, and this also depends on how far the moon is away from the horizon now, um, we, we might find some green tones, and this can be fixed with that white balance adjustment in the field, or it can be fixed in post with the tint adjustment. But we, we have to think about our white balance a little bit differently when we move these up now. But like the sun, the position is very, very important here. So we often go a little bit cooler also to accommodate for this yellow tone. But phase also matters. So this image that's above this moonlight is taken out in Canada, and we were actually shooting Orion above this peak. And then I'm pretty sure this was many years ago, so I'm pretty sure it was the full moon rising behind us. So like the sun, when the moon is close to the horizon, it's going to be much warmer in tone. And as it gets up higher in the sky, it's going to be much cooler in tone. So because it was just rising, that, that orange color, that albin glow on the mountain is from the moon. So it was really fun to play with. But also the moon phase matters too, because 
when you have full men, it means you have more light from the men, right? We don't usually shoot Milky Way or stars during the full moon unless it's risen and stuff. So this had to be pretty close to full moon, and I didn't look back at the dates, but we have a lot more light, so it's really illuminating that, and it's really giving that nice warm tone. And then we have artificial light. So mainly these are two different sources. We have light pollution and we have light painting. And we've kind of talked about these a little bit, but I want to talk about them a little more in depth. Working with artificial light can be really tricky, and let's start with light pollution. Although we all love to find dark, clear skies, that's not our reality, and there's often light on the horizon, light pollution on the horizon. And this is usually warmer in tone, and you can correct this a couple different ways, but I'm gonna focus on two. One is with a light pollution filter, a night sky filter. And what this does is it cuts out those red tones of, of light, and I'm not a scientific expert to explain that to you, but it'll actually make your image a little bit darker too, because it's not letting as much light through. So you wanna think about where you are when you're using these kind of filters. So in this image, for example, I'm in Alabama Hills, and although there's some light pollution on the horizon from the town of Lone Pine, it's a relatively small town. So if I were to stick my clear sky filter on my camera to shoot the sky, it would probably be really dark and I don't want to sacrifice the light to get rid of the light pollution. But if I were out in, say, Joshua Tree or anywhere off the coast of California or the East Coast or something where there's a lot more light pollution and I'm trying to shoot the stars, I would want to use that filter because not only will it get my image back to a better exposure, but it will cut out some of the light pollution. So we can also, and I will be showing you this technique tomorrow in editing, we can lean into the light pollution. So I created a complementary color harmony in this image here. I have the warm orange tones in the foreground and the cool teal tones of the sky. I actually lean them a little bit towards the green. So I have that teal orange combination. But in order to get, again, connect the foreground with the sky, I leaned into the light pollution and I enhanced it and added warm tones to it. So it's not this weird yellow green color. It's not great. I warmed it up so I got those nice cool, or nice golden tones. And then I also am doing another thing here where I'm light painting the inside of the arch. This was shot during blue hour just after sunset. And I'm light painting the inside of the arch. So you're leading your eye from the left into the arch into the Milky Way. There's a lot of things happening here, but in terms of light and color, that's what we're doing. And then you also have light painting. And this is actually the only form of light at night that we can control besides turning off headlamps and stuff. <laughs> but we can control the color of this. So like I showed you how you can creatively use light painting to your advantage, it's really fun to play with. This was in the swamps, this image was in the swamps of East Texas, and it was during fall, so you had the orange leaves, and this was actually taken pretty much at night. It was definitely astronomical twilight. I missed blue hour because I had paddled out, set up my camera, paddled out, stand there to take a test shot, fell in the lake, crawled out of the lake, paddled back, changed into a dress, made sure I had no leeches, and then I stood there with a the candelabra, and these are actually like battery-operated candles, so no swamps were harmed in the... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but no spots were harmed in the making of this. But when I picked out those battery operated candles, I made sure I got a warm color tone because I really wanted the orange against the blue of blue hour, which was actually night at this point, and my yellow dress. So I'm creating that color, that complementary color harmony. So even though this doesn't include stars, it was shot at night. So I'm going to leave you with two things, some fun facts and then some tips to recap. So yellow is the most visible color in darkness. So if you have yellow in your scene, kind of really think about that because the viewer's eye is going to go anywhere that yellow is in your night images. <laughs> the, the least visible color is red. Oh, I don't know what happened. 
Red is the hardest to see during darkness. So if you're shooting red rocks at night, hence where we are, you might need a lot more light to portray that red, whether you're light painting or you're shooting a long exposure or you're shooting during blue hour, you wanna have a longer exposure so you can really see those red tones. You wanna turn your light up a little bit. Don't blow it out, but turn it up a little bit. Or blue hour, you might wanna shoot earlier in blue hour. So just keep those things in mind. And then a fun fact, and I don't know if this is true or not, I just came across it in my research. Red plus green and yellow plus blue. In human eyesight, these colors cancel each other out and their light frequency instinctively neutralizes each other. So supposedly, they are impossible to seem, be seen together in terms of light color, not reflected. So to recap tips for the field, if you learn anything from this whole presentation, these are the main points. We wanna look for the prominent colors in our image and compose for those. Different lighting conditions are, at night are gonna create different colors throughout your image, so make sure you plan ahead. You have a clear vision of what you want your image to look like when you're done, and go out during those times. Take note of the colors in your foreground and in your sky, and how can you capitalize on them? How can you enhance them? Whether that's white balance, whether that's composition, whether that's post-processing, have a clear idea of that. And then learn how to choose the best white balance in the field. I promise, promise, promise it'll make your life in editing easier. And just understand how it corresponds. Cool. Oh, one more thing. Sorry. Color.adobe.com. Um, this is an easy way to easily see the most prominent colors in your image. This color wheel does not relate to this picture, but you can upload your image and it will extract the theme, so give you these colors, but you can also click on color wheel so you can see what kind of color harmonies are already there. And this is kind of important just so that you can look at it and start training your eye to see these things so that when you go out in the field, you'll start seeing them. Practice, 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 right? Now I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> And for the Milky Way, I use fluorescent cool white, and it has zero in parentheses. No problem. Yeah? Oh, great. Microphone. <laughs> Set it to 100% brightness, then stand at your camera and take the shot until it's good. So then you at least have one shot with the light good, and it may not be true blue hour, but you're getting pretty close. Yeah. And then you can also then run and adjust it. I mean, most of them have Bluetooth, but Bluetooth rarely <laughs> works in nature, it gets blocked. So you can run and adjust it, but at least you start with that. I will give you one more tip too that I just thought about that I've been doing a lot more recently is I'm shooting my whole entire image during blue hour, but with stacked whatever without the light. 
And then I will go in and I will turn the light lower and like paint it then because now I have all the light good in the rest of the image and I can just focus on that and then I blend them together in Photoshop. This, yeah. So this also allows you a little more control because you can put your layer, right? You have your base layer that's the blue hour and then you put your light painted layer and you mask out everything that's not the light. And then you can lower the opacity. So as long as your tripod didn't give bumps or didn't move, then you can just lower the opacity so that you're not trying to work against the bright light, you're just taking it out a little bit. And you'll yield a much better result that way, especially if you're on your own. Otherwise, bring a friend <laughs> and knows how to use your light <laughs> or press a button on the camera. Cool. Oh, oh, oh. At the beginning of um, when you're talking about white balance, mm -hmm. there was a chart with the orange column on the left and the temperatures mm -hmm. and, the, and the numbers. And I think I might be confused, but the lower numbers were cooler. Mm -hmm. Is that what you said? Yeah. So that chart is not telling you what those those temperatures are at that time. It's telling you how you neutralize those temperatures. Oh, okay. That's why yeah. it's easy. Yeah, it's kind of flipped a little bit, but I find that it's helpful in reference so you know kind of where you neutralize it and then you can choose how you want to change it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you're basically flipping. Yeah, so a sunset is going to be much warmer in terms of temperature, um, but that chart, actually, I can pull it back up for you guys. So that chart, so because it says 2500 Kelvin at sunset, that's obviously not the temperature of sunset. That's what you would use to neutralize those yellows. So at a clear blue sky, that's why we usually use like shade or something during that, because that's going to neutralize the really blue tones of it. Make sense now? Good. <laughs> Perfect. One more? white balance for the foreground and the sky? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm always shooting them separately um, because of the time I shoot the white balance. If you're shooting them in conjunction with each other, you won't use, if you're single shot, you'll have to use one white balance. Um, but because I shoot separately. So it's a little bit warmer during blue hour because there's so many blue tones and it's a little bit cooler during nighttime when I'm shooting the Milky Way because Naturally, the milk is actually more warm in tone. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Look, I, I have a quick thought. <laughs> Who here wants to now get a tattoo of the color wheel on them, like say red? <laughs> right? I guess we get a tattoo artist here. So. I do. All right. I will. Right. 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 So thank you and you know wonderful presentation of both. <laughs>